Hello, I'm Andrew Quint and I'm a senior writer for The Absolute Sound and today I'd like to talk about an unusual product, one that you could say is unique, and that's the Theoretica Applied Physics Bach SP Adio Stereo Purifier. Just the name is a lot to unpack, so let's have at it. Like many high-end companies, smaller ones, uh, Theoretica is very much the engineering vision of one individual, and that individual is Edgar Schuari. Dr. Schuari is a tenured physics professor at Princeton, where for several decades he has run the university's NASA-funded electric propulsion and plasma dynamics laboratory. If you visit uh, Dr. Schwari in this laboratory, you find yourself in a large high ceiling space that's dominated by two enormous rocket engines and uh, a whole lot of scientific equipment. But at the side of this large room is a discrete door that leads into a second realm that Dr. Schwari also supervises, and that's Princeton's 3D audio and applied acoustics laboratory. And there, Dr. Schuari's uh, primary interest uh, is spatial audio. In fact, spatial audio has been something of an obsession for uh, Dr. Schuari for quite some time. As a 14-year-old, he set up a quadraphonic LP playback system, and Dr. Schuari has, uh, has followed all the developments in um, surround sound uh, up to the current time. Uh, like many in the field, Dr. Schwery sees a problem with traditional stereo and by extension traditional discrete multi-channel um, that relates to the phenomenon of intraoral crosstalk. Um, when a sound is experienced in nature, um, the sound makes it to the left ear, the sound makes it to the right ear, and slight differences in the arrival time of that sound, slight differences in the amplitude, and slight differences in the tonality that are, that are caused by the uh, head and the shape of the ears um, result in a very precise localization of the sound. This is not terribly effectively mimicked by two loudspeakers because sound from the left speaker makes it to the right ear and vice versa, and the situation is further degraded if they're um, are a lot of room reflections, as there typically are in a domestic environment. Well, in the early 1960s, two Bell Lab scientists, Vishnu Atal and Manfred Schroeder, uh, invented the signal processing technique of crosstalk cancellation, or XTC, uh, to address this problem. And over the next several decades, Acoustic researchers and engineers worked to develop the methodology to the point where an XTC algorithm made it into a number of commercial products, including gear from Polk Audio and by Bob Carver. But there were issues with these early iterations of XTC. Too small a degree of crosstalk cancellation can result in a, a, a phony sort of spaciousness with uh, sometimes grotesquely uh, bloated images. And uh, ultimately, this wears thin and doesn't advance the cause of realism. In addition, when listening to these early versions of crosstalk cancellation, it was necessary for a listener to sit very, very still or else the effect was undone, the so-called head in a vice perspective. Finally, um, early XTC algorithms caused gross timbral colorations. As uh, Shahari remembers it, a piano could sound like a xylophone. So um, Dr. Shahari worked to improve um, an XTC filter, and what he came up with was Bach, B-A-C-C-H, which stands for Band Associated Crosstalk Cancellation Hierarchy. I think it should surprise no one that um, Dr. Schwery's favorite piece of music is the B minor mass by one Johann Sebastian Bach. The Bach filter then um, aims to solve the major well-known shortcomings of earlier XTC schemes. 
Uh, first of all, Dr. Shuari developed and uh, patented a very sophisticated head tracking mechanism that enlarges considerably the sweet spot for the primary listener and also obviates the need for that person to sit uh, rock still in, in, in his or her chair. Um, perhaps more critically, the Bach filter doesn't introduce any colorations to the signal. How is this done? Well, as I understand it, uh, Professor Shuari found a way to shift the XTC processing from the amplitude domain to the more subliminal phase domain where the brain is less likely to notice. This Bach filter then is the central feature of Theoretica's three uh, commercial products. In 2014, Edgar Shahari started Theoretica so uh, as to introduce his inventions into commercial products and market them. There are three stereo purifiers, as he calls them, that all use the same Bach XTC filter. The $54,000 Grand Bach SP uh, is really a device for recording professionals. It uh, comes in a substantially larger and heavier enclosure and um, has six channel DAC and ADC cards um, pretty much universal connectivity and a slew of hardware and software options that uh, are standard. The two other models are for um, audiophile enthusiasts and these include the $23,800 Bach SP Adio that I'm considering here. It also includes six channel uh, digital converters and analog inputs and outputs while the Bach SPDO at 19,800 lacks the converters and the analog uh, connectivity. ADIO, A-D-I-O, stands for Analog Digital Inputs and Outputs, whereas DIO um, just means Digital Inputs and Outputs. The uh, device is sourced from a number of places. The beautiful sculptural aluminum chassis, which is available in either a silver or black matte finish, is manufactured for Theoretica by MSB Technology in Germany. Um, the linear power supply within uh, also comes from MSB Technology. Uh, Dr. Schwery, um is not forthcoming in terms of who um, makes the uh, digital converters, but he uh, does allow that uh, they are uniquely configured for his product, that they are of the Sigma Delta type, and they operate at a resolution of up to 24-bit, 192 kilohertz. Um, his machine um, has its proprietary algorithms and convolution engines run by a powerful multi-core CPU with 64-bit audio processing. All of the Bach SP models come with a dedicated iPad that has the extremely user-friendly user interface uh, loaded in. You also get um, a, a set of small microphones that go in the ear canals to take the initial measurements. These microphones are made in Dr. Shuari's New Jersey lab. Um, and um, you also get a webcam, which is necessary for the head tracking mechanism to function. Setting up the Bach SP is remarkably quick and easy. With the iPad in his or her lap, the user accesses the Make Filter screen on the iPad, um, one of three screens that it's ever necessary to use with any frequency, and indicates whether the filter is being created for use with headphones or, or loudspeakers and whether or not head tracking is desired. Um, those miniature microphones are inserted in the ears with uh, some soft plastic covers over them. Three sizes are provided and um, you press the appropriate button and a reassuring voice comes out through your speakers and tells you exactly what to do. Uh, what happens is that there is a full frequency sweep admitted by your speakers um, first the left channel and then the right channel while the listener sits in one of three positions. First of all, in the sweet spot looking forward, uh, then he or she leans about two feet to the left and then a couple of feet 
to the right. These six sweeps uh, take under two minutes to accomplish, and that's it. You remove the microphones from your ears, and you don't have to do this again unless there's a change in your loudspeakers or the positioning of your loudspeakers, uh, the listening position itself, or something else major in the listening environment, like window treatments or a new piece of furniture. I used uh, the Bach SP Adio as a processor between my, my usual digital a file source and DAC, the 432 EVO Aeon server, and the Idion Absolute uh, Epsilon DAC, but also as a standalone digital front end. The uh, Bach SP has its own player, and uh, well, in this model, its own DAC. Uh, I played silver discs with a Sony transport and fed them to the uh, Bach SP, and uh, I even used um, the analog inputs to uh, play LPs. Two comments to make before addressing the specific spatial aspects of the Bach's performance. Uh, first of all, as promised, the Bach uh, XTC filter introduced absolutely no colorations or timbral distortions to the reproduced sound. It's very easy to compare um, the filter in and out of the, uh, the data stream by simply uh, pressing a button on the iPad and um, there, there were no colorations introduced. The second comment to make is whatever that DAC is in the Bach SP, it's, it's quite a good one. As uh, switching back and forth between the Bach DAC and um, my reference stack, uh, I really could not hear an appreciable uh, difference, uh, despite the fact that the uh, DAC alone, my reference DAC alone, um, costs twice as much as the entire uh, Bach product. Well then, spatially, what does the Bach SPXTC filter bring to the table? Well. Uh, Dr. Schwery has written about uh, six or seven different aspects of spatial spatiality, and there are four that I found to be especially relevant as I uh, evaluated this component. The first is envelopment. And with the Bach SP, depending upon the source material, the sonic image moved out in front of the two speakers and wrapped around the sides and well out into the room, um, well outside the lateral boundaries of the Magicos. Um, different source material um, gives different results with uh, the Bach SP filter. As might be expected, binaural recordings, dummy head recordings, um, perform most dramatically, followed by um, purist recordings of uh, unamplified music, classical and jazz, followed by uh, less perfectionist recordings, and then followed by more typically what Dr. Schwery calls concocted um, pop and rock recordings. But in terms of what's possible, uh, when I listened to a Chesky Records binaural recording that featured the trombonist Wycliffe Gordon, the name of the album was Dreams of New Orleans, um, Gordon was located at the 10 o'clock position well forward from the plane of the speakers, and it was believable. He was placed there because he was the leader of the band and not because that's where some mixing engineer wanted to put him in post-production. A second spatial metric is proximity and depth. Uh, this is a, an attribute of spatiality that Dr. Shahari uses to uh, entice people when he uh, brings his technology to a show. On another Chesky Records binaural recording, there's a cut called Phrases, where the uh, unsuspecting listener will hear somebody apparently whispering in their ear from a few inches away. 
um, in a more musically relevant way, this translates into a superb kind of layered depth, one that's much more subtly defined than with traditional stereo with, uh, with orchestral and, and other acoustic recordings. Another spatial metric is reverb, and uh, to listen to another classic orchestral recording, uh, The Three-Cornered Hat, by Manuel de Falla, as recorded by Bert White for Everest in 1960, uh, the work begins with a series of very aggressive sounds, uh, castanets, stamping feet, some testosterone-fueled yells, timpani thwacks, and a uh, bellowing soprano. All these sounds illuminate the large space of the concert hall in London where this was recorded, and with Bach, the reverberant tale of these sounds is convincingly attached to the initial impulse and yet doesn't obscure it. Without the filter, the recording is certainly electrifying and even atmospheric, but once you've heard it played back via Bach, it's hard to go back. And something that can only be described, I think, as a sense of occasion is missing. The Spatial attribute that uh, Bach presents that was most important to me and I think most impressive is what Shahari calls spatial extent and resolution. By extent, he explains, this means the perception that the sound occupies a three-dimensional volume like a hologram. And resolution in this context refers to the ability to discern detail and structure and structure within that extent. So when I listen to my favorite orchestral test track, which is the opening allegretto of Shostakovich's Symphony No. 15, as performed by Bernard Heitink and the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra, I always listen closely to the sequential woodwind solos near the very beginning of the movement. And with good stereo, and certainly with multi-channel, it's clear that the bassoon is a larger instrument than the flute and that the uh, former is sitting in the row behind the uh, latter. But with Bach, uh, you go a step further. Although those relationships in terms of the scale of the instruments and their location um, is clear with traditional stereo, with, with Bach, there's much more of a sense that each of these two musicians is occupying his her, or her own uh, specific real estate, even as they breathe the same air. This metric can be extremely gratifying with no small number of 50-year-old rock and pop albums, which certainly supports Shahari's contention that Bach works not just with uh, dummy head recordings, but also with many, I would say most, conventional stereo albums of recent and not so recent vintage, whatever the recording methodology was. And as just one example, uh, take um, a song from Crosby, Stills and Nash's epical first album, um, the song You Don't Have to Cry. Uh, in that recording, every one of the four or five acoustic guitars was played by Stephen Stills. And even with the best remasterings of that album that I've heard, these guitars come off as a, as a busy, almost Baroque counterpoint to the triadic harmonies that uh, ride above them. They sort of come off as one gigantic plunked, plucked uh, strummed instrument. With Bach, each of the guitars is thrown into bold relief. It stakes out its own specific real estate and presents a much more fleshed out sonic image. It also becomes really quite obvious that Stephen Stills arrived at that recording session, which was the very first for these three musicians, with a clear idea of how these ingeniously interlocking guitar riffs would come together as more than the sum of their parts. And this has musical meaning. The song is about Stills attempting to convince Judy Collins, his uh, romantic interest at the time, to move from New York to California, and ultimately she declined. And with Bach, all those individualized guitars become that many more voices talking past one another, uh, a symptom of a doomed relationship. I think it's natural to focus on the processes 
processor's clarification of individual instrumental lines and the physical disposition of the performers, but I should also point out that crosstalk cancellation, as executed by the Bach filter, can elucidate harmonic detail as well. There are some composers, I'm thinking of Brahms and Richard Strauss or Oliver Messian, who compose music for orchestra with a characteristically dense uh, texture. And these recordings can seem murky, which isn't at all the case when you hear this music played in a concert hall. Bach can improve upon that artifact of stereo playback to a substantial degree. It works as well with complex vocal arrangements in popular music genres. Uh, for example, um, compare Donald Fagan's extravagant harmonies on the title track of Morph the Cat with the filter on and off, and um, by all means enjoy uh, some of Queen's most operatic moments to the fullest. The first 45 seconds of Bohemian Rhapsody makes the point quite nicely. One option that's available on the Bach SP Adio um, is Theoretica's Bach HP filter, HP for headphones. And this technology can make headphone listening much more appealing to audiophiles like me, who generally don't care much for personal stereo. There are two, filter, two aspects of the filter that I think are notable. Um, first of all, the image as presented to the headphone wearer, wearer is largely externalized uh, compared to uh, typical headphones that put the image in the middle of your head. And this can actually be a little discombobulating if you sit in your usual listening position uh, looking at your usual stereo setup, you'll swear with the headphones on that the sound is coming from the two speakers in front of you. I had to continually take them off to convince myself that that wasn't the case. The other uh, innovation with uh, the headphone version of the filter is that uh, when you're setting it up, instead of leaning to the left and leaning to the right, you rotate your head to the left and then to the right. And um, this results in the uh, sonic picture not um, rotating entirely when you move your head. Uh, to be sure, the subject of how this compares to multi-channel um, has to come up. And I, I, I think that they are very different. Um, the spatial aspects of reproduction that the Bach SP um, filter offers is, is something very different than what multi-channel does. In particular, the envelopment is different. Uh, no question that uh, 5.1 multi-channel or 7.1 or 9.1 or Atmos um, can put you into uh, an acoustic that is, that is vast and all-encompassing. With Bach SP, it's a different kind of envelopment. Uh, individual images are sort of placed in your room. It's very much more uh, they are here rather than you are there. In terms of those other parameters, uh, I, I think that uh, layer depth, as I said, is um, more realistic with Bach SP, and uh, reverb gets the edge as well. But it's the fourth parameter that I discuss, spatial extent and resolution, where uh, Bach SP leaves traditional multi-channel behind. And as such, uh, I think Bach SP is a strong consideration for two-channel listeners who sense that there may be something missing in the two-channel recordings that they collect. In fact, I think that's what's most exhilarating about this product. The idea that there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions perhaps even, of recordings out there that uh, contain information that's been hidden to this point, waiting to be revealed by the, by the Bach filter. At, at the current time, uh, Theoretica only has a few dealers in the United States but 
uh, Edward Shahari is ubiquitous at audio shows these days, and uh, if you find yourself at one where he's doing demonstrations, I, I urge you to take it in. Well, thank you for hearing me out. This is Andrew Quint, senior writer with The Absolute Sound. Hope to see you the next time.